Hello, everyone. Um, as you're coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from. I am not at the Mark Twain house right now, unfortunately. I am over the river in East Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and I'm sure we have people from all over the place. Uh, so let us know where you're tuning in from. It's like there's someone from Cromwell. We'll just get started in about 10 seconds. Lucy David is here. Hello, Lucy David from Iowa City. Mm -hmm. My last one of my early books took me to Cromwell My uh, about Captain Riley. He was from that area. Oh, neat. Skeletons on the Zahara. <laughs> Columbia, Maryland. Hi, Emily. I recognize the name <laughs> from other programs. Yeah. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the literary court, uh, program coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm delighted to host tonight's program for Guardians of the Valley, John Muir, and the Friendship That Saved Yosemite. First, I need to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs. And we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. As a nonprofit organization, the Mark Twain House and Museum depends on contributions to share our enriching author programs like Guardians of the Valley, education initiatives, and other events with our community. If you can, please consider donating, um, and I'll provide a link for that in the chat at some point. Um, so we are welcoming Dean King this evening for a discussion of Guardians of the Valley, which is the story of the legendary outdoorsman and conservationist John Muir's journey to become the man who saved Yosemite. It is a moving story of friendship, the written word, and the transformative power of nature. Um, it is also a timely and powerful origin story as the toweringly complex um, environmental challenges we face today become increasingly urgent. Our author, Dean King, is an award-winning author of 10 nonfiction books. He crossed the Sahara on camels and in Land Rovers while researching skeletons on the Sahara on uh, trek to the Long March tr Trail in the mountains of Western China for Unbound, and was shot at while researching the feud in Appalachia. Um, his writing has appeared in Granta, Garden and Gun, National Geographic Adventure, Outside, Travel and Leisure, New York Magazine, and the New York Times. He is the chief storyteller in two History Channel documentaries and is a producer of its nonfiction series, Hatfields and McCoy's White Lightning. An internationally known speaker, King has appeared on NPR's Talk of the Nation, ABC World News Tonight, PBS American Experience, BBC Radio, and TEDx. He is a partner of Gum Street Productions, which is currently developing a feature documentary for Netflix. And our beloved moderator, uh, our, um, our moderator is Rebecca Floyd, who is our beloved director of interpretation <laughs> at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, she has worked at our museum first as a guide, then as a manager of interpreter services, and now um, at her current position. Um, and she's been doing that since 1996. Um, so very great to have her here, uh, back here um, as a moderator. Uh, we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat. Uh, if you have a specific question, you can post that, uh, post that directly into our Q&A section. Please also know that you can uh, click on uh, captions uh, to see uh, the captions for, for the program. Um, and finally, um, you can uh, purchase Dean's book through our museum store. Um, I checked earlier and unfortunately the book is not on a website, uh, but it will be tomorrow or the day after. Um, if you're interested in buying the book, I will drop my email and you can just email me and um, we'll make sure that that you that uh, we make the arrangements. Um, your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. Um, so that is it from me. 
Um, I will be in the background uh, managing all your conversation and questions and dropping you links and such. And um, yeah, please sit back and enjoy this awesome program. And I'll turn this over to Dean and Rebecca. Oh, this is such an honor, Dean, to be speaking with you. Um, I You've got a slide of the cover of your book. I have it right here too. And uh, I can really attest to really how moved I was by, by your telling of this story. It was really a very touching story. Uh, can you tell us, uh, we'll tell our audience what, just in general, really briefly, what this book is. Most of these folks will not have read it yet. Well, yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, the book tells the story of John Muir and really um, his relationship with his editor, his magazine editor at Century Magazine also edit, uh, helped him with, with his books. But um, uh, Robert Underwood Johnson who uh, was himself a significant poet and man of letters, but much less known than, than Muir, was a really exciting find for me when I started looking into, you know, how do I tell the story about Yosemite Valley and, and John Muir? Um, it really turned out that that that, that relationship um, was what made Muir have such a great impact um, on environmentalism, on creating the Sierra Club, um, on uh, becoming, you know, he's considered the father of our national parks. So it's really the the story of their journey over about four decades of of creating Yosemite National Park and and really creating the modern environmental movement. So now, in your acknowledgments at the end, you mentioned kind of what inspired you to write this story. And can you tell us a little bit about what your the moment that inspired you? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, now, can can you see my slides now? I can, and hopefully our, the rest of our audience can as well. Okay. If if you can see, I, I just I'll put up the first slide after the book cover. Um, this is Inspiration Point. They can see it. They can see it in the in the chat. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. So in 1998, I went there. My mother in law had booked a cabin for my father in law's 70th birthday. And I'm an East Coast kid. I'm in Richmond, Virginia. And I, I, you know, been to the Appalachians. I've been to Europe and seen the mountains there. And when I took in this view, it was just breathtaking to me, the magnificence and something about the crispness and beauty. I think, you know, that that moment that many Americans have when they go to the West, that happened for me there, lived up to the, you know, inspiration point. I was very inspired. And, you know, as a writer, I, I just felt like, hey, I want to be here. I want to do something about this. I, I, I use my my books really. I write my books because um, I'm I'm um, I'm interested in a subject and want to spend time in it and learn about it myself, and then um, and then find out what's important and try to sort of um, you know tell that to the reader. So um, that this was the beginning of it. I, I saw I, I saw the valley from Inspiration Point. Um, I learned that John Muir, like if you wanted to tell the sort of um, story of the valley, John Muir was the guy. And I started, let, let me just, I, I've got a couple more images of inspiration point while we're here. And I think they're kind of fun. Um, so th this is an early one from the 1880s. This is Ansel, an Ansel Adams uh, uh, picture. So I think you can see like Fisk was just trying to capture the valley. It's very sort of plain, but I think an absolutely gorgeous shot. It's the end papers in the book is is this but then Ansel Adams has this technical gorgeous you know moody uh photograph and then um this is uh this is a, a current one um by uh, a Swiss artist named Corinne Viognier and uh this is actually a collage of tourist images that she has taken off the internet and used mm -hmm. photoshop to layer on uh, one on top of another uh, you know, a brand new interpretation of the valley. So I think the valley speaks to us, you know, over time, it's got a lot to say this, you know, according to her, she thinks that, you know, there's, there's a time lapse here and a light, uh, you know, captures different light and movement. And, and I, I think it's a pretty neat image too. So I think, you know, this inspiration point has inspired a lot of people. Um, for, for Muir, Muir was inspired um, by a lot in Yosemite Valley, but, but I love, um, his first view of looking over Yosemite Falls. And um, 
But before he gets to that, he was born in Dunbar, Scotland, in uh, 1838. Uh, this is so this is that's a street of Dunbar there and this is a statue that's there now he left Scotland when he was 11 but uh but he uh Scotland really claims him and they're very proud of him uh his father was a sort of a severe evangelical Christian but his grandfather Muir's grandfather would take him out uh on walks in nature they would uh find birds nests and you know it's also on the coast they would see the crashing waves and and they just had these wonderful walks out in nature that Muir cherished uh he had the, the bible verses uh uh learned at the end of the the whip so he was uh he had, he had a pretty interesting childhood he he knew his bible verses backwards and forwards uh, and and that that was a, a very intense and interesting part of his life, part of the the um, formula that that created who he became. Uh, he migrated to the United States in um, 1849, the year of the the gold rush. But um, they um, he and his family, um, see if I can move this slide, uh, ended up in Wisconsin at, at two different farms. And Muir's father uh made the 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 children in the family work from dawn to dusk on the farm uh so Muir uh, Muir learned the the value of hard work uh he was very self-reliant very creative and ingenious um the bible was the only book that his father uh, allowed in the house but as Muir got older he he started challenging his father a little bit the neighbors noticed that he was a brilliant kid and they started smuggling books into him and um and, and Muir, finally, his father relented and said, okay, you can read the books, but you can't read them, you know, when you're working, you can't read them when you're supposed to be reading your Bible. So Muir invented uh, a machine that uh, would pull the legs, the front legs of his bed out from, from under the bed and dump them in a pan of cold water uh, at 1 a.m. And he would get up and read. Uh, the, 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 there's, and he, he became quite a mechanical uh, genius and inventor. The only one, the only machine that he made that still exists is this one right here in, in the picture. That's his mechanical desk. Hmm. All the parts of it are whittled out of wood. He whittled them and it uses clockwork to turn that cog. Uh, and he would layer his books in there that he wanted to study when he was at the University of Wisconsin. He finally left home, went to the uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, studied there, never had enough money. Uh, so he was in and out of school. The, the, um, the, the professors there knew that he was a, a quite a brilliant um, young man. Uh, they loved his uh, his sort of Scottish brogue and his uh, farm vernacular and his expansive mind. But um, but Muir ended up uh, having to um, uh, work in in factories and uh, to tr to try to make a living. Uh, he ended up in Indianapolis and in a wagon wheel factory and he would go work in these factories and and say after being there for about you know a month go you know i think we can do this better and he would change the whole line he'd say well, we're going to change this do this you know and and eventually the owners would see that he had improved the production by a hundred percent and they'd all try to make him a a partner in the in the in the place but um uh, and, and Muir, uh, he appreciated that. He loved nature. Uh, he wanted to do something for mankind, but he knew that even making broom handles or shovel handles or wagon wheels was improving the quality of life. Um, he also thought he might want to be a medical doctor or um, uh, he loved the study of nature, of geology and botany, which he had picked up at, at Madison. Um, he had a, he, he had an accident at the wagon wheel factory uh, um, where a, a needle, he was trying to fix a conveyor belt and the needle um, skipped up and, and, and jabbed him in the eye. And uh, he was blinded, temporarily blinded in that eye and had a sympathetic reaction in the other eye. And, um, and so for a while uh, was, was completely blind. And uh, at that point, he, he sort of reconsidered, what do I want to do with my life? Um, and, and, uh, this is a letter that uh, as he was, um, healing, he wrote to his, his mother, um, and he was always very close to his mother. He, he wrote, he, he wrote in journals. He loved, he loved that. But at this point he decided that he wanted to go back to nature. 
and um, and and that that was his first love, and he wanted to pursue that. So uh, he decided to to walk across the the south. He walked to the Gulf of of Mexico. When I first started learning about Muir, and I read his his walk, you know, across the Gulf of Mexico right after the Civil War, there were Confederate marauders that he faced in the mountains. I thought, boy, I can't wait to write about this. But as I figured out the the book, what my book was going to be, uh, that ended up just being one paragraph. So it's not a it's not a cradle to grave um, biography. What I realized was that um, that that Muir, I, what I I wanted to tell a, a story that had a, a nice clear arc of what makes Muir important to us. Why is he an American that we should remember? and revere and you know emulate and so he did so many things his inventions his traveling to uh, alaska and all over the world is botanizing that it's easy to to sort of get lost in his life when you read his biography you're like wow i can't believe he did this that and the other so what i did was i really sort of pared it down to this narrative of of um well um, one, uh, the, the wife of a professor that he met at Madison became a real mentor and soulmate to him and knew that he was brilliant and introduced him to people like Emerson and other, you know, H Harvard scholars. Uh, and so that was an important part of his life. And then Johnson really in the second half of his life became a, an important figure. But let me get you there first. So he, he, um, he did his walk across the South and he got malaria. He was very ill. Um, uh, and he had to convalesce again, and he had heard about California, so he decided, hey, uh, I'm going to go to California. Uh, he he took passage there, got to San Francisco um, in 1868, and uh, famously asked somebody, um, you know, how he could get out of San Francisco. The guy said, well, where do you want to go? And he said, anywhere that's wild. And uh, and the guy said, "Well, you can take the ferry right there over to Oakland." And he and in a um, a guy he had met on the on the the boat out um, then walked uh, across the Central Valley all the way to to Yosemite um, to Yosemite Valley. And it was it was winter conditions, uh, very treacherous. He was told that you know the snow was six feet deep and and deeper in places, and that there were bears everywhere, and that he wasn't going to survive. But Muir was intrepid. He said, well, I'm going anyway. Yeah, that's where I'm, where I'm bound. So he went there. He met this guy uh, right here, Galen Clark, who was the first guardian of the valley. And Galen Clark, uh, uh, Muir could survive on almost nothing. He could eat bread and, could, and, could you and tell tea. Us, Dean, could you tell us what, because that's the title of your book, What 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 is the guardian of the valley? Yeah, the, um, so early on, um, backtracking a little bit here, thank you for for stopping me there. Um, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln had given uh, the valley during the Civil War to the state of California to preserve and protect for mankind because they realized what a beautiful, special place it was. And um, it, the, the state named an official guardian of the valley, somebody to, to stay out there and take care of it. And Galen Clark, you can see he was a, a pioneer. He, he, had a, he built a cabin lived near the Mariposa Grove of, of giant trees and uh, just looked after the place, you know, uh, tried to, to, to um, keep it from burning up, got to know the, um, the Native Americans in, in the area. And um, he actually had a, uh, came out there with a bad respiratory disease and, um, and wasn't expected to live long, but ended up living a, a long, a very long and storied life and became a good friend of, of Muir's and helped him fight to save the valley. So, um, so when, when Muir got there, it was a state park and Galen Clark was, was the guy, fortunately, because Muir and, and the, um, his fellow uh, uh, traveler, a guy named Chilwell, uh, were, were quite hungry at that point, and, and, and Galen Clark served them some bear meat. Muir wouldn't eat it. He didn't, he didn't like the, the, the bear meat, but Chilwell liked it and, and gobbled it down. Um, Muir, Muir realized that it was a, a, a beautiful place, and he, um, uh, he decided he wanted to stay there. He got a job working as a shepherd. And um, and so that he could explore the the, the mountains around Yosemite Valley and get to know the place, and um, 
I, I'm happy. I would I'd love to read you the passage of when he first looks down into the valley over Yosemite Falls, if you'd like. I would love that. It is, it's pretty breathtaking. <laughs> okay. Um, just have a sip of water here. So he's, and um, do I have, let me see if I have that photograph. Yes. So he's, he's looking down um, over this fall. Can I close that? Do you see type over that? Uh, oh, the, um, who can see this transcript? That yeah. part? Can you, can you see the photograph fully? Yes. Okay. Um, so he's looking down over this fall and he, he, he was intrepid. He had no fear. No, um, he's like an, a, quite a, a mountain climber. Yes. An adventurer. So this is about 5,000 feet over the valley. Wishing to be a part of this God work as nearly as possible, Muir took off his shoes and stockings and pressing his feet and hands against the slick granite, worked his way down until his head was near the booming, rushing, energizing stream. Noticing that it leveled before its dive, he hoped he could lean out over the edge and see down into the falling water and through it to the bottom. But when he reached the edge, he discovered it to be false. Another steeper ledge lay below. It appeared too steep to allow him to reach the brink. However, once again, he could not convince himself to abandon the effort. He could see the cliff fully now and spied a narrow rim just wide enough to hold his heels. Studying the polished surface of river wall, he noticed a rough seam on the steep rock face, a fault line that might provide him the needed finger holes to reach the cliff's edge. His nerves tingled as he considered his next move. The reverberation of the water enveloped him, and he began to feel a part of it, a giddy mix of emotions, elation, wonder, fear, swam in his head. He decided again not to move forward, but then he did. Some inner wildness had taken over. As he advanced, choosing his steps carefully, tufts of artemisia dangling from the clefts caught his eye. He plucked a few leaves, bit down on them, and soon felt the sedative effect of their bitter juice. Time slowed. The slope was not his enemy. He was part of it. He crept forward, and when he reached the small ledge about three inches wide, planted his heels on it. Then he shuffled sideways like a crab toward the precipice. 30 feet to go, 20 feet, the water beside him now white and agitated as it sped to its threshold, 10 feet. At last, the edge was right in front of him. Legs firm, body stiff, arching, he peered over. His eyes bored into the billowing freefall, and he watched the spill separate into streamers of comets of water whose tails refracted the sunlight. As the creek flowed past him onto its grand adventure, his body and soul seemed to hang there somewhere in between terra firma and air infinitum. Another current, Emerson's words, he well knew. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Muir lost any sense of the passage of time, and later he could not remember his retreat from the ledge. Although a slip of the heel could have sent him over with a powerful creek, the magnificence of the fall, its ever active and changing form, its rumble and sudden silence, its action and refraction, its immediacy and its distance had him spellbound. So many stimuli bombarded his senses that there was no room for fear. Instead, where earth and water met air and light, Muir, with the religious fervor of his upbringing, saw God. He saw God in the fragmentation of the stream and in the rays of the sun passing through to make vivid rainbow beads. He saw God in the rebirth of the stream suddenly expelled from earth as death and a new life, a new journey, were simultaneously manifest. So that's his first look down into the valley. It's so breathtaking. And uh, my... um. My friend Al Benford, who is uh, is listening, he's a friend and twenty year or so colleague of mine at the Mark Twain House. He's in the chat, and uh, he has he has been to Yosemite and uh, has climbed how many times? Al, he's in the chat. Climbed Half Dome twice. So, um, 
Um, and I asked him to read this book with me and he didn't want to be on camera, but he's here. And when we talked about this passage and the 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 only thing that I could think of is that none of us could ever ex is, as wonderful as this place is. And I have not been there yet making plans. None of us will ever be able to experience it like that. <laughs> so we'll, we'll all be stuck behind the, the railings, which is yeah. probably a good thing. It's quite a quite a climb up there. Exhausting. And um, I think my next. So here 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 it is. I did it a few years ago. And you can see that's the creek going going over the um, uh. ledge. And you can actually go. You can see a railing there. So you can look down and you can see how far down he was look looking and um, just right up on the edge looking over that. So it, it is pretty remarkable. Uh, he had gone along the canyon edge looking for that place that he could look down into the valley and you know before he found it here at the creek um so it really is wonderful um and, and remarkable um entrance and experience and visceral um uh thing to to read about uh you know as Muir tells you about it and and you know I, I I tried you know in all my books I try to make the um the main characters real. And I try to um, put you on the trail with them and, and, and let you be involved and experience it as much as possible. So now you're ready to go do it for yourself. I know, I can't wait. So um, now, you know, you also come back again and again to his love of, of water in all of its forms and his amazing ability to describe it. Do you, can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, you just yeah. shared some of it. Yeah, you know, um, uh, again, I, I think for me, writing a book is is a journey um, into the the person I'm writing about and reading and studying their work and then trying to translate that through the book for the reader. Um, come in, in, and I'm not an expert on my subject when I come in. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, you know, I associated Muir with the valley and mountains and trees, but I kept reading his descriptions of water in every form, beautiful descriptions mm -hmm. of you know, climbing ice of of just here watching the 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 um the 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 water flow over the edge and be reborn. You know, um, I I didn't make that up. That's Muir's. Those are Muir's thoughts. That's what right. was you know going on in in his head. And um and and it was so powerful and beautiful. Um, uh, he he'll be he'll be, he'll be caught in a snowstorm and you'll fear for his life. And then he'll start examining snowflakes. And telling you how beautiful they are, and that looking at the crystals, and um, he he was just such a remarkable person. Uh, but but over and again, um, uh, his descriptions of of water in every form, he keeps coming back to. Really, he talks about the waterfalls more in, in Yosemite Valley than any other piece of the valley. Mm. Um, so he was really taken by them. He so much so that you know he he you know in, in one instance he climbs up. And goes out on Fern Ledge in in part of Yosemite Fall, and and nearly gets swept over, and and um, goes uh, gets off the ledge uh, after getting pounded by by the fall, which had been blown out by the wind. So he thought he was safe, and then it blew back and and hit him uh, like a like a sledgehammer, knocked him down. But he he goes out, um, uh, dries off, starts a fire eats a little something and then writes about it to um Gene Carr this soulmate of his um who you know together they inspire each other uh, to to just wonderful words and and study of of the valley and nature but um but it's 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 so powerful uh, and and he goes out there in the middle of the night to look at the moon's rays through the 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 waterfall the the um you know the 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 moon beam and uh you know just it's just amazing <laughs> so um now can, can, can do you have another story to share with your slides sure I, mean, I i can i can keep going here so he um uh he decided that uh to stay in the valley um and the the little picture in the circle is a a, a monument where he built a cabin and you can see it looks out on the lower Yosemite Fall, um, and uh, and this is uh, you know he he stayed here for a couple years, um, and and most people are so remote and so uh, rugged a place, um, most people would leave in winter, but not Muir. He loved it. He loved the snow. He he loved 
Um, he loved the solitude to a certain extent. He he wasn't um, you know a total hermit type. He 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 got along quite well with people. Was humorous. Had lots of friends, um, and and was very persuasive when he spoke. So, um, but but he was perfectly comfortable with himself as well. He was a very centered person, I think, and and that was partly because of that that um, sort of tough upbringing. Um, though even though he had Bible verses kind of you know um, whip, whipped into him, uh, he he never lost his faith either. He was very faithful, as you could tell from that last passage. Um, but he was he was finding his own path to spirituality here in the mountains, and um, and and he felt that the study of the mountains, learning what what made them, what made this valley, um, uh, was was very important. And and for him, it was God work. You know, is studying God's creation. It, and he really uses that to help to help um, you know the the public to he he uses that string that. Um, um, the, that that this is religious and spiritual to engage people to get them to participate in in trying to save the the valley, right? He he does, yeah. It's, he uses it's that really, argument um, that this is God's work. Yeah, yeah. If you really want to dis distill Muir down to you know uh, a, a sentence or two, um, for him, uh, Yosemite Valley and other wonderful works of nature were were God's temples. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe contrary to popular belief, he didn't just want to preserve and protect them and keep people out. He didn't want to keep people out at all. He wanted to bring people to them the yeah. way, uh, you know, a, a priest would want to bring parishioners to, to the church because yeah. he, he felt, you know, that's where um, you were closest to God and, and where you could find um, spirituality, uh, where you could um, sort of cleanse yourself and... Um, and become whole. And that was very important to him. Um, and, and, um, something that really, uh, he then, uh, set about trying to achieve his, his entire career was, was, um, being able to save special places like this, but also getting people to, to access them. Yeah. That comes back again and again, as, as different people, um, are sort of vying against his, his, his and Johnson's efforts is, uh, that, well, if I could just get you, can I just show you this place and it will speak for itself. You will not want, you, you will want to preserve it uh, if, if you see it. And, uh, and it's, it's interesting, you know, Muir is also credited with, 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 um, you know, my, my career's work is in interpretation of a historic site and his work really lends itself uh, to the beginning of the interpretation programs through the National Park Service which is that same thing. If you bring people to this place, light a little bit of a spark in them, and they will want, the, the hope is, is that they will want to treasure it. That, that's so true. He, he never lost his faith. You know, he, he did go through some political battles, and um, he always felt that uh, if he could get people to the valley, get them to nature, that they would appreciate it and do the right thing. And, you know, I guess if there's a, a, a good message for today, um, that's probably, uh, you know, well along the route of what we could learn from Muir is that uh, the way to um, get people conscious of, of the need to, to save our planet is to get them to, to love nature. Um, if, if we just try to get people to change their, their habits and ways and not really appreciate why and to have an emotional attachment in, in uh, you know, e intellectual as well um, mm -hmm. by by going to nature, then it won't be as effective, and we'll be arguing, you know. Right. Um, so, um, he, um, so Muir would um, leave the valley, get married. Uh, he married the the daughter of a prosperous fruit farmer, and for ten years he ran a fruit ranch. Uh, and, and uh, his wife um, was uh, Louise Strenzel, wonderful woman who um, didn't particularly like to go out into the mountains, went to Yosemite one time. And here's a picture of John Muir from his journal. He's pushing her up the hill with a stick. And he drew that picture for their daughter, uh, Wanda, so that she could see. And, you know, again, he's got a great sense of humor um, and, and he had to help her along. But um, uh, she was more of a homebody. She loved the fruit ranch. 
She uh, played the piano um, and, and they got along great. She realized that, that Muir was a very special man and that he needed to be out um, preaching the gospel of nature, which he had been doing in magazines while he lived um, in Yosemite and, and afterwards. And even while he was working the fruit ranch, um, he was he was writing about nature. Um, but he, he, he the, the the ranch demanded a lot of him. And say, did uh, he feel did he feel torn between his responsibilities to the, to the fruit ranch and his longing to be out in nature? He he loved his his family. Um, he was he was a very hard worker. You know, going back to his youth again, and um, he was he was getting drained. And I think he he sensed that, and she certainly did that. Um, that he just didn't have time to go out into the mountains and he didn't have time to, to sit and think like he liked to do and consider and observe. And, and, um, and I think, you know, Johnson who had become his editor, Johnson was his editor at century magazine as a younger man was getting more and more senior and, um, and was, you know, wrote him a letter saying, Hey, you need to be writing about nature. And eventually um, uh, Louis, his wife, um, encouraged him to go back to the mountains. He was good friends of a painter named Keith, Sorry. who who painted who painted, and they they went out to the mountains, and then they went uh, up to Mount Rainier. And Muir did the the fifth known ascent of Mount Rainier. Here you can see this uh, icy uh, top. It was a very difficult ascent, but it sort of restored his um, uh, presence in nature again and his knowledge that hey I do need to be here and a uh, wonderful thing while he was out on that uh expedition Louis wrote him and said look we need to we need to you know, lower the pressure here either get some help on the ranch or sell it um, because this is what you need to be doing there's a wonderful letter from her um, that he receives when he gets uh off the mountain uh which which just uh, tells you how deep their their love and uh was for each other and and uh they had two daughters that Muir was very close to so it's a, there's a wonderful family life uh that goes on behind somewhat behind the scenes in this story but it but it's also present so there's there's no sense of you know her feeling deserted or did did she take an active role in in running the farm in his absence or did they hire additional help or a little of both she uh, well at, at, at times they would have 40 or 50 people um working on the ranch and she knew it because she grew up there with her father running it so she did all kinds of stuff for him mm -hmm. um including editing you know helping him with his writing so um everything from the paperwork on the farm to she was a nature lover loved the the you know knew knew the plant life and um her father uh, experimented with um you know creating different kinds of of um flowering fruit fruit plants so uh, she she was very steeped in all of that and i think a real anchor for Muir and and worked alongside him and is it is it the the their ranch the farm that really um that supports them i mean is there's there's a point at which he's telling you know, this is much later in the story he's saying johnson do whatever you can to help advance this message send the bills to me is, and he you know where is is the money all coming from ranching or is it through his writing or a little of both uh the he he is earning um money from his writing but the the ranch is a, another scale it's it's very successful okay. uh his father builds a a big you know base a, a mansion um at the time with um it even had a you know eventually would have a phone and um you know all kinds of modern amenities for for the day and it's still there you can visit it it's in martinez um it's a it's a beautiful house the ranch was you know hundreds of acres um so um he did become you're you're right he he became wealthy and was able to support the the environmental movement for a while and and uh, send funds to Johnson when they're fighting their political battles. Uh, he, so here's Johnson, um, Johnson and Muir. Uh, and here's, here's Johnson a little bit later at his desk at the Century Magazine in New York City. So um, Johnson had uh, edited Muir for quite a while and, and handled him. Johnson was a very gifted diplomatic uh, editor. 
Um, I, I go into his history, which I probably can't get into too much tonight, but um, he had done a, a, a series on the Civil War uh, that um, really is, is a, a, one of our amazing um, histories of the Civil War, where they interviewed um, leaders from both sides of certain battles and, and told the, the, the stories of the battles from both perspectives. And they did that for three years. They doubled the circulation of uh, Century Magazine from 125,000 to 250,000. It was really a, a leading um, uh, literary light for the nation back when, uh, during a time when magazines were very important. Right. And, you know, Johnson gets Twain in on that, too. Twain, Twain writes one of those um, on the Civil War series. I mean, his is fiction, but uh, <laughs> but he, he gets in on that because, you know, and, and, you know, since we are we are Twainers, uh, there are a few in the audience. Johnson becomes uh, Mark Twain's editor for the century as well. So he's another author who's under his wing. So, uh, and, and, you know, they, uh, Mark Twain is socializing with, with Johnson and there, uh, I mentioned it when we first met, there's over 92 letters Mark Twain addressed to, um, to Johnson and the Century Magazine. If you just search for his letters containing things about the century, it, it goes way above that. So, um, it, it was interesting to me to see this connection, Muir and Twain don't seem to have known each other. But they knew a lot of the same people. Yes, and and Johnson and and Twain worked together on the uh, international copyright bill. Yes, um, yes. which really, in some ways, elevated Johnson uh, in, in the political realm and would empower him in in working for the environment. Uh, after that, um, so Johnson. Uh, goes after doing the Civil War series, which had been such a spectacular success for um, for the Century Magazine. They decided to do a series on the Gold Rush, uh, and so um, Johnson goes out to San Francisco finally and meets Muir. They have a a, a pretty uh, humorous meeting in the Palace Hotel, this big fancy hotel, and Muir Muir's not you know. I think he's partly putting it on, but he's, you know, he can't find his way down these hallways, uh, you know, if you put him in the, you know, he says, you put me in the mountains and, and I can find my way. I can read the signs, the trees, you know, the glacial uh, striations and and find my way around. But, but these hallways, these confounded hallways, you know, I get lost in them. So it, it's pretty funny. Um, they, they meet, they hit it off and uh, Muir convinces Johnson to go to Yosemite with him, I, I doubt that he had to uh, really, um, uh, you know, browbeat him too much. I'm sure Johnson really wanted to go to Yosemite with with Muir, and so they set out together. And um, and I, I do have a a, a brief passage of, of their time there that I'd love to read to you. Um, <clears throat> in the evening, they reached Soda Springs in Tuolumne Meadows at about 7,000 feet, and set up their camp by the river. Muir and Johnson talked at length by the fire under a ceiling of stars until Muir tucked Johnson in with his feet toward the fire. The next morning after sunrise, Johnson would call it a revelation of glory as the clear sun came bounding over the solemn glacial peaks. They set out to explore, heading through the open evergreen forests into Tuolumne Canyon, which Johnson later described as the wildest region ever haunted by the god of silence. One dense break of low-slung birch saplings nearly demoralized the editor, but he managed to squeeze through it into an open gorge at the base of a waterfall descending from a thousand-foot wall of granite. All along, Muir, who leaped from rock to rock as purely as a mountain goat, according to Johnson, or skimmed along the surface of the ground, a trick of easy locomotion learned from Indians, chatted away, often ribbing Johnson for his lack of outdoor skills and inability to keep up. Now that he could see Muir in his element, Johnson was in awe of him. In the wildness, Muir looked like John the Baptist, as portrayed as bronze in bronze by Don, Donatello. He was spare of frame, full-bearded, hardy, keen of eye and visage, and on the march, eager of movement. So I love seeing them bond uh, out in the mountains. And I think you get a feel for 
again, Muir's specialness over and again, people who saw him out in the mountains, bounding over the rocks and uh, climbing, uh, you, you know, were, were in awe. And he really was one of our, our best uh, alpinists. And they're, they're beautiful moments, you know, um, that when I, when I talk about him going up to the fall and that wildness taking over, that's not the only incident of that. Um, right. He will be scaling down into a canyon um, and he will get to a very dicey place and he'll tell you that his body takes over. He's feeling his way. And all of a sudden he sometimes thinks I can't, he can't go any further, but his hands and his legs do, you know, do something. And, and all of a sudden he's doing it. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, part of his faith and spirituality, that's part of it is that um, in his ability to become one with nature and, and, and live in it in an extraordinary way. Well into his seventies, you know, he's still climbing mountains. Well, th <laughs> this, this, anyway. this is earlier that, okay. that, that all, you know, that he can really scale the mountains like that though. Um, he was going uh, with uh, uh, the Sierra club up, you know, in, into Yosemite, um, you know, at, at a much older age, um, up into his, you know, late 60s and um, probably, probably right around his late 60s. Okay. Um, now, could, could I ask you another question? So sure. on this, this track, when he's with Johnson, um, they, they hatched the plan, isn't it, Johnson? Uh, and he, so what's the plan that they, that they hatch? That's it. And, um, so they are in Tuolumne Meadows. This is uh, the one piece of fiction here. That's that's not those aren't real bubbles coming up out of the water, and that's not real lightning. But uh, uh, Soda Springs is this evanescent um, uh, pool there, and and you know Muir takes Johnson. Johnson drinks this you know lovely water, and people will p make pilgrimages to drink this water. It's still there, but lightning strikes. A uh, figurative lightning strikes. The two um, start talking about, you know, down in the lower valley, um, they had they had seen that um, it wasn't being that well cared for. Um, Muir was devastated by that, and um, and and also Johnson had been able to see how spectacular it was down in the lower valley and up here in Tuolumne Meadows, and so uh, they devised a, a plan to try to to save uh, the park. Muir um, again, Muir early on realized. Um, that if you save the valley, but you don't save the hills around it, he said, it's like saving the fingers, but not saving the palm of the hand. Um, you know, you, you got to save the whole thing to have it work. And, um, and he knew from being uh, a, a farmer, um, how, how valuable that water was up in, in, in the Sierra Nevada and how important the trees were and how, you know, if, uh, and having been a shepherd, he could see that the sheep had eaten up all the grass and dug up the plants at the roots, which he knew was going to lead to erosion, which would eventually affect the streams and ruin the valley, um, destroy the trees. So um, one of one of Muir's famous sayings was that all things are connected. And so he knew that everything from the, the smallest blade of grass to the mountain, the, the um, that was all connected. And it was connected for the farmer down um, on the coast, who, you know, the fruit rancher down there needed that water. And he he believed he said the streams, our waterways, start with the trees, um, and the the roots hold the water in, and they they channel the water in. Um, it, it, they 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 keep the snowpack in so that the the water can stay and then come to us in a, a measured, wonderful way that sustains us through uh, the the year through the hot summer. So um, they, they decided that um, what they could do was um, try to create, you have Yosemite State Park, which is the valley. They could try to create a national park around the valley that would really preserve the valley. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and Johnson, uh, who's a man of action uh, and, and knows the political realm, says, Muir, you write me two stories. I'm going to run them in Century Magazine. Then I'm going to go down to Washington. I'm going to put them on every congressperson's desk, and we're going to get a bill passed. Uh, so it's a wonderful moment, really uh, the beginning of, of a new relationship uh, between the two that will um, you know, be, make them very active in, in um, uh, the political realm, uh, something that Muir hadn't thought possible. Uh, so um, 
Johnson's going to activate Muir in, in a in a way that um, Muir hadn't uh, even conceived of. You know, it, it's not just going to be his words and his descriptions and his love that's going to inspire us. Um, it's really going to be, uh, you know, in the active political realm through Johnson that they're going to have a big impact on on the nation and the way we um, come to preserve our wilderness. Oh. And it's a it's a complicated history. Um, you know, when they, you know, I found it so fascinating that when they do achieve that saving of those forests, all, all surrounding Yosemite Valley, that Yosemite Valley, as we know it, is not actually part of the National Park yet. It's it's still in the hands of the state of California. It is a, it is a, you, you love a nice, clean narrative, but history almost never gives it to you, you know? <laughs> So, so yes, you have the you have the state park. Now you have a, a, a national park that's created around it, and um, like a like a donut. Um, the state park's really still not being cared for up to the standards that that Muir would like it to be. Um, also, there are problems of you know bringing roads in through the federal park into the state park. You have different jurisdictions and all kinds of complications that are created by this. Um, uh, so but there's a fair amount of kind of wheeling and dealing and sneaking around. Yes, <laughs> figured out too. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, you know, Muir and Johnson are going to decide that hey, you know what? It really needs to be one place under one leadership, uh, and so they're going to try to um, the the creating the federal park was kind of a piece of cake because it didn't you know it didn't really harm anybody. It's up in the Sierra Nevada. Um, it didn't include a lot of, uh, you know, some of the, the shepherds, the sheep herders were not happy about it, but um, but it was pretty remote countryside. But they decided that they needed to, that, that the optimal situation would be if it were one federal park. So then they had to uh, campaign for the recession, the return of the state park to the federal government. And uh, as you can imagine, you know, uh, people who are proud of their state and their local place and region, um, you know, aren't that keen to give anything back to the federal government. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was going to be a lot of politics and it was going to take a long period of time uh, for that to occur. Um, in the in the meantime, um, uh, here's here well, here's here's a letter after the National Park is created. I love this. this oh, yes, yeah. please read it. Yeah. The Johnson writing to to Muir. Dear Muir, sound the loud timbrel. Hooray for you. Yosemite is saved and the Lord must be happier. So there again, their, their sort of um, their faith and their, um, you know, sort of this triumphant tone, uh, uh, you know, after creating the park, uh, they're so happy. They've achieved so much. Um, but there's a long way to go. There are all I these guess, trees. I'll just interject here. When we got to that point and like, okay, we, we win. And I was like, but there's still 150 pages of this book left. <laughs> what, what more could happen? Yeah, so. immediately, immediately after they created the national park, then local interests came and said, hey, but, you know, um, we really want to mine there. We want to cut down trees there. And they went to their local Congress people and they started, you know, chipping away and fighting. And, um, and Muir and Johnson are going to have to battle that. And Johnson says, hey, Muir, you need to start an organization out there. I could do it out here in New York, but, you know, it's not going to be effective. You need it out there. And, and Muir says, hey, uh, you know, he still thinks he's, you know, just a writer and a spiritual leader. And I, I, I don't want to run any kind of organization. But there's some, some professors around Stanford and San Francisco that, that are also thinking, hey, we want to um, encourage the use of the Sierra Nevada for um, for uh, recreational activities and for spiritual release and that sort of thing. And so they get together with Muir and form the Sierra Club in, in 1892. And uh, Muir is immediately elected president of the Sierra Club. And you can you, you will detect in reading the book and reading his letters that he becomes very proud of that. He's very proud of the, at the founding of it. And um, he, he remains the president for life. There, there's a there's a great moment in 1895 where he's still fighting. You know, he's delivering a speech to the Sierra Club, and he, and he says, "Hey, I, I'm not the guy to go fight these battles, these political battles. It, you know, it's our vice president right here. He should be doing it. I need to be out there. You know, um, in in the mountains. Um, so 
And, and I think that was partly tongue in cheek. He knew um, that he was an important leader and he'll become more and more important. And at one point he'll tell uh, Johnson, daggone it, you've, you've made me a, a lobbyist, you know, um, but I think he's proud of it. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and he, he, he becomes an organizer and he, he, you know, because he's a grassroots guy at heart and wants to bring people to nature, um, he, 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 he brings women to the Sierra Club, you know, brings women to nature in a way that they hadn't been included in a long time. And there's some moments, I think, in the book where you'll see that um, them talking about the freedom that they feel there, that right, they don't know, have you, in the cities. Um, you include, uh, it's, it's Helen Monroe, right, who um, goes on a, on a high trip with the Sierra Club and talks about how freeing it is for her. Yes, uh, uh, the, the a, a poet who um, start, is, starts poetry magazine in Chicago is a wonderful writer. She um, she gets involved and um, and tells uh, ab- about these trips out there and um, how freeing it is and what it's like for the for the women and how they can hike through these valleys and and see see nature and they can do what the men can do and and you know they're very proud of it and they form these great bonds. So. Uh- you know, in the founding of the Sierra Club, um, you, can you talk a little bit about the the big trees? Yeah. The um. So at the same time, you know, Muir's Muir's back to writing stories and roaming around the mountains and going out to see the sequoias. Forestry is um, uh, in its sort of early stages. There's there's no real um, forestry science up until this period. So um, logging um, interests are just going in and clear cutting everything. And, you know, they've done it from the East Coast all the way across the nation. And, um, and they're, they're creeping right up to the, the border of, of Yosemite um, uh, National Park. Um, Muir, Muir's exploring, you know, of course, there's not just Yosemite National Park. There's also, you know, what becomes Sequoia National Park and Kings Canyon, spectacular areas with spectacular trees. Muir goes down there. Um, he he's he stays uh, in, in a forest fire and watches the fire work on nature. And he understands the the cycle of life and how the fire is necessary and that that it, how dynamic forests are. Um but uh, but he also realizes that that you know nothing is destroying them like um, uh, West Western man who's coming in with axes and just chopping them down and even these these giant sequoias that are thousands of years old and aren't particularly good commercial wood they're just they seem to be a challenge mm-hmm. um, you know and and so um, they're getting cut down. Um, mm-hmm. th- yeah, this this is the Mark Twain tree, oh. <laughs> and um, Mark Twain is alive and and well and traveling in in Europe. And you could probably tell us more about that than I can. But yeah, you know, he's off trying to save down. his own um, resources and and um, pay off debt and living abroad uh, when this happens. Do we? But we don't know why they called this the Mark Twain tree. There's no sort of like connection to him, right? It's just yeah. they named them after famous people. You know, yes, I haven't been able to find, but he was the most famous um, writer and humorist at the time. And so I think they just named this spectacular tree after him. Mm-hmm. I don't know even if he knew. I can't find a reference to that. Right. Um, so what what happened to the Mark Twain tree? I, you know, nothing, nothing particularly special, I think, happened to the, you know, the Twain tree. Um, it just, uh, you know, kind of a disaster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they cut it down. The, um, can you talk about the general noble tree? Yeah, so this is the general oh. noble tree, and um, you, I, I have a short passage that you pointed out. I know, out uh, it's page one fifty three. I was so moved by, so it just brought me to tears. Um, just, just two paragraphs. Let me read it for you. As the general noble tree fell in the Converse Basin Grove in eighteen ninety two, a year after Twain's namesake met its demise. The giant sequoia lurched back against its stump in its death throes, as if admonishing the jubilant lumberjacks who had just severed the last fibers of what is believed to be the largest tree ever cut down. The mass of 3,000-year-old sequoia, named after the sitting Secretary of the Interior, both until that moment still very much alive, 
sent the men leaping as it smashed scaffolds and rigging. They fell onto the wildly vibrating stump some 95 feet in circumference, the Chicago stump as it would become known, and found themselves balancing on wobbly knees in the midst of their own self-induced earthquake. They would make a 30-foot tall cross-section of the tree, cleanly cut at both ends, hollow it out, and then prepare it for transportation to Chicago, where during the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition, it would be erected in the White City, in the rotunda of the government building, ringed by benches and outfitted with a special, with a spiral staircase. So horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so sad to me. And, um, and, and again, you know, you know, so it wasn't just the loggers, it was institutions that were coming. Um, people couldn't believe how big these trees were. And even if they saw photographs, you know, there were photographs, you know, back to the time of the Civil War, but they they just didn't believe it. Uh, they wanted to see it. And then there were um, people who wanted to take advantage of it and do um, almost like freak shows with the trees, you know, get get a cross section and, and take it out. But, um, you, you, you know, mentioned earlier how you would love history to give you a very clean narrative. Both Muir and Johnson go to the Chicago World's Fair, um, but neither gives you an account of seeing the tree, um, you know, right. th that, that is erected there in this kind of spooky, and maybe they just avoided it. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, Muir's not particularly impressed at, uh, at the fair and kind of wishes he was back with his family and his letters uh, to, to them. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's just uh, sad that it, that it took them so long to, um, to protect the trees. Uh, we were, uh, my wife and I were out there not long ago. It's very hard to um, get a photograph that, that can, can, you know, show you how big these trees are, but I tried to do it here. You can see the arrow on the, the image to the left. Mm -hmm. That's, that's actually me down there at the base of the tree. And here you can see a, a closer view, just how big that tree is. That, um, that is the bull tree. It's, it's obviously still in existence. Uh, it was part of the Converse Basin, which is the biggest grove of sequoias uh, in existence ever. And Muir went out there and met with the loggers, and they and they even said, "Hey, if you can get the federal government to pay us to buy them, we'll 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 sell them to the to the government." But they were in the midst of already cutting it down, and there was no re way he could get um, any kind of movement on that quick quickly enough. This is now in um, Sequoia National Forest. Um, which, uh, and, and so, uh, we drove for several miles down a dirt road and then hiked a mile and a half into the bull tree and uh, in October, this past October, and we're able to sit there for, um, and have our lunch at the base of it, uh, mm -hmm. and never saw another soul there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you still can find solitude and wonderful moments in the forest. Um, ironically, the bull tree is named after the the manager of the the forestry of the logging outfit that was cutting down the whole Converse face, and he saved the one tree, and it got named after him. But he's also responsible for cutting down thousands of others. <laughs> um, but uh, but but that was a wonderful moment for for me to to be able to go out there and just sort of commune a bit with this tree um, during this period. Muir and Johnson. Um, helped create uh, a forestry commission uh, that would would basically um, lay the groundwork for the, Nash, the the forestry service and save a vast swath of of trees uh, around the country, creating the national forests. Well, Omar's back, and we haven't even had a chance to talk about Gifford Pinchot. Uh, and if we have time, I want you just for a moment. To talk about these sort of different philosophies between Gifford Pinchot and his philosophy of 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 how to um, maintain the national park and and Muir's. Well, Pinchot was our our first um, our first forester, and he went to Europe to study forestry, and we needed we needed that. Um, but uh, he came back uh, more with the ethos of farming the forest and um, uh, setting up a situation which we also needed. And Muir was not impractical. He understood that. 
um, particularly at the time, we used the trees for you know all kinds of building, built back the nation after the Civil War um, using the forest. And, uh, and so um, uh, Gifford Pinchot was very much about creating forests that could be sustainable. Um, and, but, it, but it was all about harvesting them, farming them and using them. Um, whereas uh, Muir and they became known pejoratively as the nature lovers, um, they wanted to keep them more in their um, original state, um, the, the way they were, um, you know, came, came to be. And uh, so there was a uh, back and forth. That was part of the, the national debate is how much, um, how much do we preserve sort of in its original state? How much do we take and really try to, to farm and make available to loggers? Um, and how do we do that in a sustainable way? That was all policy that was going to be ironed out over the time. Um, and again, um, you know, history is not, you know, this perfect black and white. It doesn't give us a clean narrative. Um, but, but when we get far away, we try to, we try to distill it down to, well, Muir thought this way and Gifford Pinchot thought another way, but in actuality, they camped out together during that, that time when the forestry service was coming together. Um, I realize we're probably running low on time. If you want me just to run through a couple more things, I will. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll say to the audience, if you do have questions, for Dean, pop them into the Q and A. Omar's already there, but yeah, please show us the rest of your photos. What do I have here? Okay, so that's a sequoia cone, uh, oh, which wow. is really <laughs> it's a it's a tiny, <laughs> gorgeous little thing, and you can't take the cones out of the national parks. But I was in a national forest; I was able to bring a few home, um, and they're 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 just spectacular, beautiful. This is um this is just an image from the Sierra Club, uh, and and it was the women they did high adventures up in the park. Um, long, you know, a uh, month to six weeks out there and um, really created this grassroots movement that would that would go out across the country and um, be useful in uh, the, the, this battle for, for Hetch Hetchy, um, which is really the uh, last half of the book is about um, uh, this battle. This is a part of the, the, the National Park, the Yosemite National Park. And San Francisco comes to, to wants to dam it up and create a reservoir. Um, Muir says, "Hey, um, we we shouldn't do that. You can get this water lower down." San Francisco wanted to take it here because it was easy to get from the federal government and wouldn't cost them anything. So th there's a big um, big battle uh, over the course of 15 years, the last 15 years of Muir's life uh, for this, but. Um, Muir used, you know, mobilized his grassroots movement and letters, thousands of letters were written to the Congress people on this issue. Um, uh, uh, here's a map. I, sh I maybe should have showed this first. It gives you an idea. There's the valley down low. Hetch Hetchy's up in that um, sort of northwestern quadrant. Um, but um, the argument also was that if, if you dam that up, then all these slopes that drain into the valley Nobody's going to be able to use that. Nobody's going to be able to camp up, camp up there. And the valley's already crowded. And Muir wanted to have that that rooms for people to be able to come in out of the cities and 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 um, be able to commune with nature, really. Um, and so, but but Muir has become quite famous. Theodore Roosevelt comes out and um, camps out with him for three uh, days, uh, and um, President Taft. Uh, does as well. And, and really, um, you know, when they come out there and spend that time with Muir and listen to him and, and sleep out in nature, um, it really has a very powerful impact on them. Um, I have a brief passage on Roosevelt I can read, but if we've run out of time, I can leave it for the reader to find it in the book. So Omar, what do you think? Do we have time? Yeah, we have a couple minutes. Okay. All right. Um, this is... Uh, um, after Roosevelt has spent his time with, with Muir and, and Roosevelt, the crowds of people were trying to get him. They, you know, and, and Roosevelt kept evading them. He just wanted to be out there with, with Muir. Um, this is afterwards. Back on his whistle stop tour, Roosevelt made use of freshly inspired elocution in the vein of his new friend Muir, telling Sacramentans, Lying out at night under the giant sequoias had been like lying in a temple built by no hand of man. 
a temple grander than any human architect could by any possibility build. And I hope for the preservation of the groves of giant trees, simply because it would be a shame to our civilization to let them disappear. They are monuments in themselves. In California, I am impressed by how great the state is, but I'm even more impressed by the immensely greater greatness that lies in the future. And I ask that your marvelous natural resources be handed on unimpaired to your posterity. We are not building this country of ours for a day. It is to last through the ages. The president's deeds would be even more impressive. He would sign into existence five national parks, 18 national monuments, 55 national bird sanctuaries and wildlife refugees, refuges, and 150 national forests. But John Muir wanted one more thing, more than any, anything else right now, the recession of the Yosemite grant to make that special place whole. So he still hasn't gotten the, the state park at that point. But mm -hmm. um, you could hear in, in, uh, in President Roosevelt's words, Muir's philosophy. So not only had Johnson helped him get out and change policy, but he, Muir, Johnson was also getting him these interviews and getting him, he was telling Roosevelt's people, hey, if, if, if the president's going to go out to Yosemite, he needs to see Muir. And he knew that once Muir got a hold of them, um, he would have this kind of impact. Yeah, he apparently had, it was just magnetic. It sounds like in person that he was captivating. Yes. Oh, uh, so Omar, do we have any questions from the audience? Are there, I don't see any in the Q&A, no, but maybe there's something in the chat. I don't see anything. Uh, folks just had comments in the chat. Oh. Um, yeah. So no questions. No questions? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Let's see if I have any others before we run out of time. So. Oh, I don't. I we think I think we covered. Um, unless you want to get into the the San Francisco waterworks, um, you know, <laughs> if you want to finish up, uh, and there they are in their late late years. Yeah, I've I've just got it. I've have two other images I can All talk right. about. This is actually Muir and and John Burroughs. But um, I wanted to bring him out of the woods. I think we're all used to those wonderful photographs of him and with his you know the long beard in the woods. Mm. But um, he really was. Um, uh, a man who enjoyed the company of uh, of others, particularly intellectuals and other writers. And he and Burroughs were, um, who was a leading um, uh, not a writer about nature and very close to, to Roosevelt as well. Um, they, they got to be great friends. Muir visited uh, Burroughs at his um, uh, kind of um, Thoreau-like cabin in the woods in, in upstate New York. Um, so um, I just love that that sort of happy grand image um, and then uh, this is just uh, a, a wonderful moment when I was out in Yosemite in, in October, and I, I use it just, just to say, you can still go to Yosemite National Park and um, find your moment of solitude, um, because you hear how crowded it is. It is very crowded. The fall is a great time to go. Um, this is just a spectacular sunset where, you know, the light is coming right through and, and, and hitting half dome. And I'm not a particularly great uh, photographer, but... Uh, uh, you you know it's such a spectacular place you can't can't go wrong so I encourage everybody to to get out there and experience it for themselves oh. well Dean thank you thank you so much uh, for for sharing uh, this book with us and it's it's just out right what what will your next project be um I, you know I I have a couple I, I'm about to launch on a, a pretty big tour I'll be um, Going through Texas and in the um, in the Northeast and then out in California and the Pacific uh, Northwest for a couple of months, you can see I have a, a travel um, calendar at my website deanhking.com. Uh, and then I, I have a, a, a couple other ideas. I may go back to my maritime uh, uh, passion, uh, or uh, I may stick with uh, the the environment too. So I'm going to see which, which way um, it, it goes. Uh, I think the the environment is such an important topic right now mm -hmm. that um, that I might want to stay on it. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, as as the book comes to a close, you, you highlight. You know, these are still 
questions. You know, California is still struggling with water <laughs> and the lack of it and so on. It's um, it's still a conversation that is in a, in a fight that is still happening. Yeah, clear, clearly um, we're, we're dealing with all sorts of um, weather gyrations and, right. and climate issues that, uh, that um, we need to have an informed conversation about. And I think, you know, this is just some some background here. Uh, Douglas Brinkley has a, a great uh, book out uh, right now called Silent Spring uh, Revolution. And um, this, I, I heard him speak recently, and um, really his book is about the 20th century political wars. And it starts with Theodore Roosevelt and talks about Franklin Roosevelt, and then about um, Rachel Carson's book, which um, started another, he thinks, revolution in thinking about the environment. And it really crystallized for me. It made me realize, well, this was the whole precursor to this. This laid the groundwork for all that. So I think the more informed we can have a conversation about, you know, um, how we came to this land and how we've treated it and dealt with it and and how we need to preserve it for the future is, you know, the the, the better off we'll be. Oh, and uh, Marsha Spieth out there, who's a, a, a relative of mine, says, stay with the environment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm I'm leaning that way. All right. Oh, uh, the, the, there did one question did pop up there before we say goodbye. Was there? Um, um, oh, just no questions. But thank you. It was fascinating. <laughs> so uh, just a comment there in the questions. Well, again, this has really been a pleasure to hear you tell us this story and to talk about your work. Um, it is um, just a. a, a an, an amazing volume. I was riveted uh, up to the very last page, and uh, I hope that uh, members of our audience will enjoy it too. And good luck on your really, it's a book tour that you're embarking on. And this is the real, we're at near the beginning of it, right? Yes. Yep. So, just just um, kicking it off. <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending your evening with us. This has really been a joy, and I'll send it back to Omar. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks to you for moderating, and thanks so much, Dean. Uh, for for joining us and talking about this amazing book, um, I'll just close uh, things up with um, with a with a plea, a request to, to join us for future programs. On April 11th, we'll be talking to the author of *An Assassin in Utopia*, which tells the true interlocking stories of the on Oneida community and its radical founder and eccentric newspaper publisher, President James Garfield, and a one-time member. Of, of the community um, who assassinated him. On April 13th, we'll be talking to the author of After the Miracle, The Political Crusades of Helen Keller. And on April 18th, we'll be talking to the author of Must Love Trees, um, a new book about the author's deeply personal connection to our forest companions. Um, and finally, please join us at the Museum for a Tour. Um, we're open six days a week from 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, and you can visit our brand new exhibit, which is absolutely amazing. It really um, is. It really is. Uh, for business or pleasure, uh, Twain Summer Sojourns, which focuses on the Clemens family's American summer vacations between 1870 and 1910. There's just so many amazing cool stuff. Um, we had an exhibit opening um, on the 23rd. Um, and it, it, it was really just blew my socks off. Um, what yes, your first exhibit on. opening at the Mark Twain house. Wasn't yes, it yes, it was. Uh, so please come and see it and see the house and, and, uh, and see Rebecca. <laughs> please do. We, we tell a good story. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. So and much. thank you, Dean King. It's really been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you, Rebecca and Omar and, and everybody who tuned in. Enjoyed it.